This morning, I want to open in prayer, and then we're going to dig right into our worship uh, set this morning. But let's let's just quiet our hearts before God as we get started. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege of being here together today. We thank you for the worship of your people. And uh, as we sing about your grace and your mercy in our lives, uh, don't let us just allow these to be words. I pray that you would help us to find the truth in the things that you've been doing in our lives and what we're about to sing together. God, we give you praise this morning for your cross and for all that you did for us in that place. We look forward to whatever it is that you're going to teach us today, and we give you praise in your name. Amen. Everybody guys can stay standing because these first ones are the fun ones to kind of get your nervous energy out if you want um, I think uh, I think most of you know these songs pretty good though and Jesus keep me near the cross there's a precious fountain free from all a healing stream flows from Calgary mountain oh, in cross, oh in the cross, oh be my glory ever, till my ransomed soul shall find and rest beyond the river. Why don't you turn around, say hello to a few people. Uh, by the way, we do have a couple uh, of new uh, students here today. There's uh, Ruka from Japan. We want to welcome you here today. And uh, Zimna, she's from Mexico, and Naya's from Mexico. So uh, we're, we're glad that all you guys are with us today. Near the cross a trembling soul, love and mercy around me. There's a bright and morning star to shed his beams around me. Oh, near the cross, near the cross, be my glory ever till my ransom soul shall find the rest beyond the river verse 4 and near the cross I'll watch and wait and hoping trusting ever till I reach that golden strand and just beyond the river in the cross will be my glory ever till my ransom soul shall find a rest beyond the river great is your faithfulness O God you wrestle with the sinner's heart us by still waters and to mercy and nothing can keep us apart so remember your people remember your children remember your promise so oh God cause your grace is enough and your grace is enough and your grace is enough for me your grace is enough heaven reaches down to us oh your grace is enough for me oh for me 
is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in a song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Cause your grace is enough, your grace is enough, and your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough, heaven reaches down to us, oh, your grace is enough for me, oh, for me, cause there's a land that is fairer the day, in the faith we will see it afar, for a father awaits prepare us a dwelling place there oh in the sweet by and by oh we shall meet on that beautiful shore oh in the sweet by and by oh we shall meet on that beautiful shore oh we shall sing on the beautiful shore Sorrow no more, not a sigh for the blessing of rest. Oh, in the sweet by and by, oh, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Oh, in the sweet by and by, oh, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Verse 3 To our bountiful Sweet by and by, oh, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Oh, in the sweet by and by, oh, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Oh, in the sweet by and by, oh, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Oh, in the sweet by and by, oh, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Thank you guys. You guys can be seated this morning. It is good to have the band back together again. It's nice to have the drums in the background and the piano. I don't know if you guys can hear the piano, but Joel is really doing a good job on that back there. I can hear it up here anyway. Um, you know, I it's, it's funny when you prepare songs, the songs that God lays on your heart. And uh, I just... Um, Maybe I, I started listening to myself a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> it's one thing to preach something. It's another thing to uh, to live it out. And I preached uh, a week or two ago about uh, Job, you know, really kind of falling on his knees before the Lord in worship, uh, regardless of what was going on in his life. And uh, it's funny how God convicts you on that. Uh, and really kind of gets under your skin and says, you know, have you praised me lately? And uh, I found myself uh, when I was down here kind of preparing for this yesterday, just kind of disappearing into the songs that we're about to sing. And uh, they should all be fairly familiar to you. And so I want to I wanna invite you to do something a little bit different than what we, we usually do. Usually we just kind of play songs and, and you guys sing or not or whatever. Uh, I want to invite you to kind of bow your heads and settle your hearts before God. Uh, Pastor Wayne is going to come in a few minutes, and he's going to be sharing uh, something that God's laid on his heart. Uh, but I, I think um, I think preparing for what God has to say to us looks like us kind of falling on our knees before the Lord to begin with. Uh, and so I, I just I want to invite you, if, especially if you know these songs, uh, just to kind of close your eyes and, and pour out your heart to Him as we're singing this morning. 
Uh, I love the words to the, each of these next three songs. Uh, the first one says, you're calling me to lay aside the worries of my day, to quiet down my busy mind and find a hiding place because you're worthy. Is that not true this morning? How often do we come and we're overwhelmed by everything, right? That's the way our world works. But God wants to invite you to come this morning and just kind of quiet your heart before him and claim his, him as worthy this morning. So let's, let's just take a few minutes and, and, and worship him this morning over the next few minutes. You're calling me to lay aside the worries of my day. Quiet down my busy mind and find a hiding place worthy. Yes, you are worthy. I open up my heart and let my spirit worship yours. I open up my mouth and let a song of praise come forth. The worries of my day will quiet down my busy mind and find a hiding place. we could ever bring worthy of all the breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show.
guide you, open up my eyes in wonder, and show me who you are, and fill me with your love, and lead me in your love to those around me. Because, Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest as without you I fall apart cause you're the one that guides my heart is that your testimony this morning cause Lord I come and I confess oh, bowing here I find my rest and without you I fall apart cause you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you oh I need you oh every hour is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free cause holiness is Christ in me Lord I need you oh I need you and every hour my way and I cannot stand I'll fall on you cause Jesus you're my hope and stay so teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Cause Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you sing that one more time cause Lord I need you oh I need you and every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God how I need Father, we have so much to thank you for this morning. I cannot help but think of the words of these very songs that we've been singing, and you are so worthy of our praise. And we just lift you up this morning, and we just we ask that you would enter into this place, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. And we pray this in the name of Jesus this morning. May you touch our brother this morning as he comes to share. Give him the words that that we need to hear this morning. Not the ones that are comfortable, but the ones that we need to hear this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to invite...
Father Wayne to come at this time. <laughs> and any of the kids? Is there junior church today? Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Just a little advertisement before we start. Back, you'll see a whole bunch of books at the back, and I thank Pastor Kevin for helping me to line them up out there, but those are a part of the library that I once had, and uh, I hate just throwing them out. I asked a pastor friend of mine a while back who had retired what he did with all of his books. He said, I threw them in the landfill, and I cannot bring myself to do that. They're good friends. And many of them I've read numerous times and over and over again and shared them with other people. So if you are a reader or want to learn to be a reader, help yourself uh, to them and uh, use them if they can be used by the Lord to help you. Father, we are here this morning because you are almighty. Teach us that. Show us that. In Jesus' name, amen. When I started way back uh, coming here and Pastor Kevin asked me to preach once in a while, he gave me a choice. I could either preach what I wanted to preach myself or try to follow along with the Bible readings that some of you are doing through the year. And I decided to follow the Bible readings that you're reading. And my, what incredible truths. I've read the Bible through numerous times. When I was pastoring, I had a goal to read through the New Testament every month and read the whole Testament twice a year. And uh, not always was successful at that, but tried to do that. But I have been just so incredibly blessed as I've gone back through some of these passages. And although some of them have been passages that I'm all also studying in some devotionals that I do each day. And Job was one of them. I just finished Job not too long ago. And I don't know if you find it hard to read some of the Old Testament passages or not. A lot of people find the Old Testament hard to understand and read, but it's not what I don't understand that bothers me. It's what I do understand that bothers me most of the time. Job is one of those books that basically is talking to us about suffering. One of the books back on the back table is by a man by the name of Scott Peck. He's a psychologist in the States and has written a number of books. And one of the books that he has written is The Road Less Traveled, A Psychology of Love. And in that book, he starts his book this way. Life is difficult. This is a great truth. One of the greatest truths, it is a great truth because once we truly see this truth, we transcend it. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult. Because once it is accepted, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. I wish it was quite that simple, but it is that truth that life is difficult. The problem that most of us have, we have Job's problems and his friend's problems. Did you understand the fact that Job is 42 chapters long? Did you know that? 38 of them, or well, 37 in actual fact, of them are Job arguing with his friends. And then God steps in. And so I want you to think about that and keep that in mind as we go along. Jesus told us that his commandment was that we were to love each other in the same way I have loved you. Now that's our goal here this morning. Our foundation is Jesus Christ, not ourselves. Our problem, I think, at least my theory is, that our problem is we watch too much opinionated TV programs, talk shows. I don't like talk shows. They are a pooling of ignorance. 
They really are, if you listen to them. It's just somebody's opinion. Let me tell you something, folks, this morning. Yours and my opinion this morning don't matter a bit. God's does. And that's what Job's all about. Job is about the fact that God is in charge and not us. In doing this, Pastor Kevin shared with me a website that you get through your church, and I don't know how many of you use it, but I did. I used it, and I listened to a guy by the name of Francis Chan talking about these last two or three chapters of Job. And Job talks to us about the fact, or God talks to Job about the fact that he's God. And here in this uh, lessons that Francis Chan was talking about, he said that our, our job is to submit to God who created the universe, listening more closely to Him as He reminds us of His great power and authority. There once was a man named Job. Do you remember that? In your first chapter 1, verse 1, who lived in the land of Uz, he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. But then the, the scriptures start out in Job with Job's friends coming. You know, they started out well. They came and they sat with Job and didn't say a thing. They kept their mouths shut. They were doing great. And then they started to talk. Now, don't get me wrong. If you read those passages, which many of you have, I hope, you'll find out that those friends said a lot of good stuff but they were sidetracked by one thing. They just figured that Job had to have sinned because of the trouble he was going through. First mistake. They jumped to a conclusion and went right over the cliff. And they spend the next number of chapters, these three guys who are his, quote, friends, hammering away at Job, trying to get him to repent of sin that he hadn't committed yet. And he came awful close to getting mad at them. He came awful close trying to persuade them that he was, chapter 1, verse 1. He was that man of integrity back there. And so they began. Now, I, I hope to hear some of these, some of you young people who are going to have kids one of these days, name your kids Elphaz, Bildad, or Zopar. Now, some of those names are mighty close to some of these uh, uh, alien shows that you watch, you know, Star Trek and all these guys. And so he argues with them. He calls on God, making his arguments about himself. He tries to get them to understand that what's going on with him is somehow God is mad at him. Job's number one mistake. He blamed God for his suffering. Now, you and I have an inside track because we get to read the first part of that chapter as well where God says, and I have no idea how this happens. Please don't come to me afterwards and try to get me to explain to you how Satan gets into heaven to talk to God because I have no idea how he did that. God doesn't let us in on that either, but he did. And he starts to accuse Job of serving God just because of what God gives him. Now, we have to be careful there because there are people who preach that today. You serve God and He'll give you everything you want. He'll prosper you financially. And I read one of those yesterday. Almost thought, well, I should buy into that. Well, I got riches way beyond my bank account, believe me. And so they argue with Him over and over through the first few chapters or many chapters of Job. And then our friend Elihu, remember him? He, he was the guy who came in. He's a young guy, actually, in these three uh, or these four friends of Job's. And, and he comes in with the theology. Boy, I tell you, this guy is going to straighten these guys out. And he says that. Listen to me. I'm going to straighten you guys all out. And so he's going to bring the theology into this now. You know, any, you got any friends like that? Over the years, I've had a few friends who wanted to straighten me out theologically, and uh, they're still trying. 
And so we get this theology lesson from Elihu. And he doesn't like any of the arguments the other three guys are making. He's got the right one. And so he straight proceeds to straighten them all out. So that's kind of the background that we've already heard some about in the last. And then we come to God. Are you God or like God? Now, I brought some tools with me this morning, and some of you have already seen them. I, I brought a measuring cup that any of you want to use. I, I brought my hammer and, and my saw, if you want to do some pounding and nailing. Actually, you know, my first project in school, or when I was a younger guy, I needed to build myself a desk, and I built it with my hammer, a saw, and a square. That's all I had back in those days. But I've got them here for you because we're going to build some things here in the moment because God is going to ask us to. And then I, I brought my level and a straight edge. And, and this will go both ways. You can level this way or you can level this way. And I brought my tape measure because we're going to need to do some measuring because God's going to ask Job some of these questions. Anybody see the full moon last night? I anybody here want to take my tape measure tonight and see if you can measure how far it is from here to the moon? Huh? Can you create anything? I love the good carpenter work. I have carpenter projects all over the country that I've done. All my kids, both kids, Harvey and ne Debbie both have... Debbie has a whole house full of stuff that I've built. Corner shelves, blanket boxes, uh, a display cabinet. Uh, my son has things that I've built. And uh, I love making furniture. There's a church in Ontario that has a beautiful, beautiful oak communion table that I built. Very proud of. But you know what? I had to use all materials that God had already created to do that with. Couldn't create a thing without it. I love measuring. You know, what's the old adage for carpenters? Any car How many carpenters have we got in here? How many times are you supposed to measure? Twice. Measure twice. Cut once. I still get it wrong. <laughs> I worked with an older carpenter one time, and I said, I was had a beautiful, beautiful piece of birch plywood that I was about to cut for some uh, cabinets we were making, kitchen cabinets. And I was taking a good long time to cut it. And he said, what's your problem? I said, I'm scared I'm going to cut it wrong. He said, you know what happens if you cut it wrong? I said, no what? He said, you'll cut another piece. You just start over. But ask yourself the question this morning, are you like God? If you go back and study about Satan, that's exactly where Satan went off the rails in heaven. Because he wanted to be God. Oh, and by the way, if you go back even further to Genesis when we already read, and you look it up, that's exactly where Adam and Eve went off the rails. What did Satan do? He came and said, God won't be, you know, Give, give me a break. God would never do that. He won't kill you. You won't die. But if you want to become like God, then bango. You know one of our problems today is? Man's trying to be like God. He's trying to think that he is the end all. I was saying to Brenda yesterday, I said, you know the only thing that I've learned with all the education that God allowed me to have is it has how little I really know about anything. So then God steps into the picture, remember? In chapter 38, the title in my Bible simply says, The Lord Speaks. Now when God speaks, beloved, you and I need to listen. Job said back in chapter 23, but he, talking about God, knows where I am going, and when he tests me, I will come out as pure gold. For he 
For I have stayed on God's paths, and I have followed His ways, and not traveled aside. Trying to convince his friends that he hadn't sinned. He would have been fortunate if he had just stayed there. Can you argue with God? We try to do that. Then the Lord said to Job, in, verse, in chapter 38, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? Are you God's critic? But do you have the answers? And that's where the building media comes in. Can you set the foundations of this world? Here, you want to, you want to level? Any, anybody here? Show me how you can level out the foundations of the world and set the foundations of this world in place. Can you do that? No. I can't. Want to build some C? Here's the measuring cup. I'll give you a lot to measure cup. Here, go build a lake. This is quite a big measuring cup. I'll have to if I can get it's a it's a liter. Well, I don't even know what a liter is. <laughs> oh, here it is. It's a quart. On this side. No, I do know what a leader is. Teasing. Hold your hand up like this. How much water can you get in that hand? Not much, right? Hey, people, get this one. In Isaiah 40, God holds the cup of his hand and measures out the seas. There's the Atlantic Ocean. There's the Pacific. There's the Indian Ocean. In the cup of his hand, our almighty God measured out the seas of our world. He spoke. And all the things that you and I enjoy around us came into being. He just spoke it. I was sitting in my chair in the, on our deck this week. I love hummingbirds. How many of you like the hummingbirds? And we got a little guy, and I don't know, he, he, maybe he somehow was at a bigger crowd and, and he got pushed aside. You know, at my home, in our table, there was five or six of us, five of us kids, three girls and two boys. And, and you know what, you sometimes had to fight for what you're going to get to eat. You know, you just go at it. And so sometimes the smallest guy, which would have been my brother, he was the little guy, you know, he could get pushed aside quite easily. And I don't know, maybe this little guy was like that, but he's just a little tiny fella. And I love to watch him come to the feeder. And I look at him and I say, how in the world did anybody ever come up with a design for that little bird? He's got all the makings of a great big bird. He's got wings. He's got a, man, in fact, he's got a longer beak than most birds. And fly. That little fellow can flutter, and sometimes they'll come right up to you. And you ever had him come up and look you right eyeball to eyeball? I love it. Except I'm always scared he's going to hit me on the nose with that beak. But it amazes me. And as I watch him, I just am awed that my almighty Father in heaven created that little fellow. I love what God has done, the flowers that we have. And yet, how long do they last you? Some of you ladies got all your flowers around your houses. And you know what? These kind of chilly nights remind me that soon all those flowers are going to be hit by something called frost and they're going to wither and die. And yet you've spent all that time and energy putting them together and enjoying. Well, I hope you have enjoyed them. And God went down through the list asking Job, can you do any of these things? And then he turns on people and he says to Job, can you determine what nations are going to do? Can you determine who's going to lead this nation or that nation? Can you determine which nation is going to arise over here and rise up there and going to take over? No. 
And then Job replies, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> it's too bad he hadn't learned that way back at chapter 2 or 3. But Job just teaches me again how often I struggle and I, how often I go on about life and try to figure it all out before I turn to God and ask him for the help I need. We sang songs, and that one, the first one we sang, I appreciate Pastor Kevin picking that one out because it says, I believe. And the question for me this morning is, do I really do I really believe that God is the almighty God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth? Do I really believe that? Do I believe that Jesus Christ was the savior of mankind, that he came to earth, born of a woman, lived his life here on earth, and then gave his life on a cruel cross for my salvation and rose again on the third day? Do I really believe that? Do you remember the story of Lazarus? Lazarus died, and when he got, Jesus got to the home, Mary and Martha were upset and were saying to him, if you had only been here, if you'd only been here, our brother would not have died. You ever think of the irony of that statement? If you'd only been here, God is already here, folks. He is here. It says in that same passage, Jesus wept. And I've heard people say a lot of times what the Bible says, that people there observed him crying, and they assumed that he was crying because of his love for Lazarus. Why would he cry over Lazarus? He knew what he was going to do. He knew that he was going to raise him back to life. I think he wept because he had been with these people all those years, and yet they still didn't believe that he was the Son of God, that he was the Almighty of the universe. And I don't attack them, and I don't blame them. I'm the same. There's lots of times in my life I look at my life and the way I handle it and the way I do things and the decisions I make, and I say, hey, you know what? I'm the same way. I don't believe he's the almighty God. If he's the almighty God, can't he handle the problems that I'm going through? That's where Job got caught with his friends. They were trying to figure it all out. I'll tell you what, I can't figure it all out, and if you can, you're a better person than I am. I get scared looking at the world I live in. It's in a mess. And it's going to get in a bigger mess because my Bible tells me that in the last days things are going to get worse. Paul told Timothy that. And oh, by the way, did you read your New Testament passages of Paul in Corinthians? It's all about being going through troubles and the comfort that God will bring to you in your comforts. I wish I could tell you that every time I got in trouble and God took me through those uncomfortable times in my life that I could say I just believed in the Almighty Father and it went really smooth. No, it didn't. I relied on the understanding of Wayne Briggs way too often instead of going immediately to God the Father Almighty. Job goes on to say in that passage, in chapter 40, he said, you told me. He says, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now. 
Amen. I know you. I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I set in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Here we are back at that story again. Remember, we've pastor's gone through some of the passages he has, and I've looked at some of the passages I have over the summer, and over and over again we come back to that repentance thing, don't we? We come back to that thing where we need to come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I repent of my ignorance. We're a lot like the young fellow, you know, when he was 16, he thought he knew better than his father. And when he was 25, he was amazed at how much his dad had learned in those few years. We're a lot like that, aren't we? I know that back when I was a younger man, I had a lot of theological questions all in a nice, simple little box. And I had the answers. And over the years, as I've grown older, God has blown those boxes all to pieces. And God sat down and he judges Job's friends and he judges Job and asks him the question, are you God? And the answer simply is no, you're not. And he goes to his friends and he says, you need Job to pray for you. I find that interesting. Why didn't God just ask them to pray to the, him himself? But he said, you go and ask Job to pray for you. Because I think he was trying to reconcile these relationships back to the basics of where it needed to be. We need each other, people. And if we're going to be all that God wants us to be, we better learn to get along with each other better than we've ever had before in our lives. We're going to need each other more and more as we face into these worlds. I've been praying all week for our schools and our people going back to school, our kids are going back into situations that is going to scare most of us half to death. They're going into situations I had no dreams of when I was going to school. But they still have an almighty God to go with them, right? we got teachers and people who work in our school systems who are going to have a tough time in these days ahead. But you know what? The end of that book, what does God do with Job? He blesses him double to what he had before. Double to what he had before. Paul tells us in one of his passages that he said, you know, the, all the problems and troubles of this old life are nothing to be compared to the glory that is to come. It's not over yet, folks, and it won't be over until we face God face to face. For you see, it says, then he died, in the last passage of 42, Job died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. Life is all about God, and it's not about you, and it's not about me. I have a hard time getting that in my head. This life that I'm living right now is about God and not me. Lots of times I want to make it about me. I can tell you many a times back through my years of making it about me. I remember I had a rough time in one of the churches I pastored and uh, got a bad vote. And I can remember going back to the, to the uh, parsonage and my, I had a, an ox yoke that I'd gotten in Nova Scotia, actually. Got it right from Havelock. Some of you people would know the man's name if I told you his name that gave it to me. And it was sitting on my lawn, and I can remember going out and hanging over that ox yoke and saying, God, what are you doing to me? Get it? What are you doing to me? Why is this happening to me? And here I am hanging on this ox yoke, and God came down and said, it's not you hanging on that cross. It was my son who died for you. This is not about you. It's about my son. People, it's about Jesus when you go to that job tomorrow. It's about Jesus when you go into that school, to the Tuesday guys and gals and men and women who work there. It's about Jesus. 
It's not about us. And so I think we all in our day-to-day living need some times in the mornings to get up and repent and let God have His way instead of my way. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I woke up this morning singing that little chorus, and uh, I, w- I want to get it right for you, so uh, let me just... What a mighty God we serve. You ever sing that, Kevin, here? What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. Did you adore Jesus this morning before you came to church? If you start your day adoring Jesus, I promise you, your day may not go easier, but it'll go better. My favorite passage of Scripture, life verses actually, are trusting God in all my ways and lean not on my own understanding. In all my ways acknowledge Him and He will direct my paths. Not me, not you, not my friends. In one of his prayers, Ray Stedman, in praying from this passage of Job, said, Teach us, Lord, to accept what comes from your hand, knowing that you will take us through the struggles and bring us out into a broad and wonderful place, as you did Job. Paul said in Corinthians, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. We will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with His comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. In the study of history and looking back at some, through some of the big wars, especially the Second World War and the Holocaust and people in concentration camps, it was proven over and over again that people who trusted God and gave to others in the midst of their miserable and suffering were the people who came through it stronger. And many of those who didn't, who focused on themselves and their own survival and everything else was gone by the way, those people often died long before the time came. We all suffer one way or the other. Many of you here, I have you on my prayer list for praying for your physical healings. Because I know physical healing is not easy. It's hard. Emotional healing, mental healing, sufferings are difficult. I don't like them, but they come to us. And we won't change it by focusing on ourselves and saying, oh, poor me. The worst time in my life is when I have this pity poor me party for me. It's when I focus outward and see the almighty God that I serve that this is only for a moment. Only for a moment. That it is God, Paul said again in 2 Corinthians, who enables us. It's God who helps us to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us. He has identified us as His own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything He has promised to us. What I am this morning is what God has given me. Do you believe that? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Then let's live it. Let's go out of here and go out into our community and look at the people around our community. How many of you prayed for the houses between here and the main road, the roads? 
340. Every house has got people in it. When you go to town, how many do you pray for the people when you go by? You stop at the stoplight, are you complaining about being slowed down, or are you praying for the people around you? You know what our world needs? It needs Christians who believe in God the Father Almighty. Not ourselves, not our churches. These will all pass and go away. But you and I will live forever because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to take people with me, don't you? Would you stand with me? I prayed about how to close this sermon this morning because I, I, I want God to show us himself in a mighty way. And, and I want to have prayer this morning with our students and some of the people who work for the school boards. And I don't know, maybe you drive a bus and think that I, you're just a bus driver. No, you're not just a bus driver. You're an image of the incredible, eternal God when those kids get on your bus. Maybe you are a janitor at one of the schools and you're just a janitor. No, you're not. You're an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you work behind the scenes in the office or maybe you... Where's Melanie? She's, I saw her over here somewhere. She, there she is. She's a librarian. She's not just a librarian. She's an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, kids. You headed out to school on Tuesday. You have no idea what the school year holds. It's going to be somebody going to poke fun at you. I can remember those days. You're just a farmer. In a town of 2,000, I was just a farmer. No, you're not. You're an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. I had a vice principal once say, you're not going to amount to anything, Briggs. Because I was being bad in the classroom, probably teasing some girl or something. I have no idea what I remember what it was that I did. But I do remember when I got my first degree, my father took it in and he laid it on his desk. <laughs> said, here, here's that kid that wasn't going to amount to anything. Don't ever say that to any kid. You love him. So I, I'd like to pray for Anybody who would like to come forward and, and stand here with me? Melanie's already up here. Who else works in the school system? Anybody else here work in the school system? Would you like to have pray for you, buddy? What do you do for the school system? Bus driver? Most important job you got because the kids see you first and last every day. If you'd like to come and I'll pray with you, how many students are here? Got some kids here? I know we got two on the platform. You want to be prayed for? Come on up. Come on up. Let's just let's let's do this thing right. Let's go to God first. Let's go to God first. Father, we're here this morning because you asked us to come and serve you. Father, my heart's heavy this morning because I know that school is starting. And, Lord, our education system is, is really going further and further away from you. Every year it seems that we go further and further away from what it is, Father, that you have set the foundations of good living to be. Father, we're serving worldly gods. We're creating our own little idols and we're, we're creating ourselves as gods. And Father, we've got people here who are going into that system to work. Lord, they're going to be made fun of because of their stand for Jesus Christ. And, and Father, in many of our schools now, to even speak up about Jesus 
is going to be a threat to their job. Lord, we're going to need all the strength that you can bring to this. And Lord, we need you to do that for us. And so I pray for Melanie, and I pray for our brother over here who's a bus driver, and I pray for our kids on the platform and Elijah back at the controls. Dear God, I ask in the powerful name of Jesus, He who rose from the dead, a victor over sin, hell, and the grave, to give that victory to us, that you would bring that here, Lord, and give it to them. We're not going to argue with our friends about where we stand, Lord. We're just going to stand. We're not going to prove to them and try to prove to them our righteousness and our integrity. We're going to let that live through our lives. Father, we're not going to even try to bring out all the theological answers and stuff. We're just going to live for Jesus and love on people. Love one another and show love to those who despitefully use us. For Father, that's what you've asked us to do. Lord, you told us in Isaiah 40 that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And so we're waiting upon you in these days, Lord. And so in this next day or so, as we prepare our hearts for that day, Lord, I ask that you would lay a burden across our church, that every one of us on Tuesday morning when we awake from our sleep, that we will remember the people who are headed off to school and get on our knees and ask for the power of God to go with them. We're in this together, Lord, each and every one of us. Father, there are tons and tons of people around us in our communities who need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we want that our lives would live that way. Now, Father, anoint us with your presence. In the powerful name of Jesus, we ask this. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. Amen. God bless you. Take away my 
As you can be seated. And thank you to Pastor Wayne for 